What's up guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to walk through the appliances and the accessories on the 2021 Adventure 80RB. So starting right up front here, the very first thing we are going to cover is your Happy Jack system. So uh, this is a wirelessly controlled system. It will be controlled with the remote. Uh, generally orientation of that remote is going to be facing forward from the rear. We will get your eyes on that remote and show you how to operate that properly. Uh, but while we are right here at the front jack, it's important to note that you will have a manual option uh, in the event that you have a power loss situation and you need to load or unload the camper. So uh, what we would do in that specific situation is first thing we need to do is disengage the motor. We're going to do so by moving this into this secondary position here. Once we've done so, we can go ahead and remove this cap off the end what you're going to find is a oversized allen uh, crank and you will find the corresponding crank on the interior of the unit as long as this motor is disengaged you can go ahead crank that either up or down as needed of course you would have to do that uh, for all four corresponding jacks so it's not something that's going to be quick or easy but it will get you out of the a bind in the event you find yourself um, without power so moving on here, we have our six gallon capacity propane water heater. So this is going to run off of propane with the uh, 12 volt direct spark ignition. The manufacturer of this appliance has a couple very specific recommendations when it does come to maintaining it. Uh, so as a whole, anytime this unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it's very important that we do store it without any water in it. So what we're going to do is drain the fresh water holding tank if it's been in use. We will drain the low point drains, and then we will finish up with draining the water heater separate. Uh, before we go and try to start draining it, we need to make sure that it cools down and that it is at a workable temperature. I will generally recommend my customers to wait overnight before trying to drain it just to be sure that it uh, isn't gonna burn them or something like that. So once we've cooled it down, uh, it's at a workable temperature, we need to depressurize the camper overall. So we wanna make sure that we have uh, no new water circulating through that freshwater system. So if we are running off the potable water tank, it's as easy as flipping that 12 volt uh, water pump switch to the off position. If we are hooked up to city water, we are just going to physically turn that water off at the valve. So once we have no new water circulating within the unit, we need to go ahead and de depressurize the water heater. What we will do is we will go to the hot side of the nearest fixture, whether that's going to be an outside shower in this case, or some fixture there on the interior. We're going to open up that hot line. And what that's going to do is open up the check valve that is within here, the water heater, and relieve that built up pressure. So once we've done that, we are going to take a inch and a 16th socket and extension, and we will remove our drain plug here and once we do so, the remaining five and a half, six gallons of water is going to evacuate the tank from this location. Now on the flip side of that conversation, when returning the unit back to service, it's very important that we prime or pump six gallons of water into the water heater before we start trying to heat it. So what we're going to do is of course, replace our drain plug, uh, tighten it down, may have to give it a couple wraps of Teflon tape to make it watertight, but once that's back in play, we will repressurize the unit using our choice of water source here. Once we've done that, we are again going to go to the hot side of the nearest water fixture. Again, in our case, that's going to be the outside shower. We're going to open up that hot line. Now we're going to see something slightly different than when we were depressurized the unit. We're going to first see a lot more water, but we're also going to see a lot more air. So what's happening is as this tank fills up, it's going to displace that air, which you will see uh, at the fixture. Now, generally it takes about five minutes for this to go from empty to full. Uh, that flow is gonna be very spitty, very interrupted while it does so. When that flow normalizes at that fixture, that is your indicator that you do have five gallons of water uh, within the tank, and uh, you can go ahead and start heating it as you desire. So, uh, one other thing to mention is this is of course your drain plug. We've talked about it in that capacity from here on out. This is also an anode rod. So what an anode rod, anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. 
they deposit onto the water heat or onto the anode rod and eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. So this is a consumable part. Generally, we see our customers get a year or two of service before this needs to be replaced. This is what it looks like when it's in brand new condition. You'll know it's time to replace because it will be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit. Make sure you keep your old one, take it out, take it to your nearest RV dealer. They will be able to set you up with a new one. Uh, and then moving on here, we have uh, our water sources. Uh, first up is going to be our potable water fill. So what we're going to do is stick our drinking water hose directly into the orifice. We will fill it up till we are satisfied. Once we've done so, we cap it off. Now this is pressurized by that 12 volt water pump. So we need to make sure we turn that water pump on. That will draw that water up from the holding tank to the fixtures and make it usable. This is of course going to be our off grid option or boondocking option. And then down below that, we have our city water connection. We will use that in the capacity of an RV park or anywhere where we have access to full-time running water. Uh, now we talked about how your uh, potable water is non-pressurized. Now your city water connection is going to be uh, pressurized directly from the water line. So water pressure becomes very much important. Uh, generally outside in the wild, you're going to find a working water pressure that is generally unsafe for what these units are rated for. So it becomes very, very important that we always use a water pressure regulator with this unit. We include one with your purchase. Now, if at any time this were to get lost or damaged, please make sure that you do replace this before taking your unit back out. Uh, when we go to hook this onto the camper, we are going to place this in line. Uh, as close to the water source as we can. So I like to hook this directly onto the spigot if possible. From there, I take my hose, screw it on the end like so, take the other end of my hose and attach it here to the camper by rotating this trailer bound connection. Very, very important that we always use a water pressure regulator. Uh, and then beside that, we have our 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. Uh, this is going to be how we of course feed power to the camper uh, you are going to utilize this uh, power cord that comes with the unit and it will only plug into the camper one way so if we take a look here at the end of the plug we have two slanted uh, receptacles and one l shape if we go ahead and line everything up properly it's going to plug right in there and this is a twi lock, twist lock connection so what we do is we give it an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it on then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and keep that connection nice and secure. We don't want this to loosen up on us or maybe have somebody uh, prematurely disengage it uh, by accident. So uh, with every unit that I deliver, uh, I have a secondary recommend recommendation where uh, I recommend a 30 amp, 110 volt surge protector. Uh, what that's going to do is that's going to protect all incoming power into the unit of course, I don't need to tell you that there's a lot going on within this unit uh, electronically. Without a surge protector, you will open yourself up to not only natural surges, substandard wiring, use and abuse power poles, things like that. So, uh, of course, here at a, as a dealership, we have some recommendations that we make in terms of how to use the products and what products we would like you to use. If you do have any questions on just what we recommend, please feel free to give our, par our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to educate you uh, just on what we recommend. And then moving on here, we have our battery compartment. Of course, we are out here on the lot, so we do not have power to this unit or batteries hooked up. Uh, when you come to take delivery of the unit, you will find two Group 24 lead acid batteries here in this compartment. Uh, now with any lead acid battery that's going to carry a little bit of maintenance, every 90 days we will remove those vent panels, inspect the water level, and refill with distilled water as necessary. That's going to keep that battery in tip-top shape longer for you. Uh, also in this compartment we have our push-pull battery disconnect switch. It is labeled in terms of direction, so if we want to go ahead and have everything connected and working properly, this needs to be pulled out. And then if we are going to go ahead and store the unit for long term, we want to disconnect those batteries from that 12 volt system because with any 12 volt system, you will find kind of nominal or phantom draws running in the background uh, from the day to day. No big deal. No worries. Compounded over many months of storage, they will start to wear and tear on those batteries. Uh, and then moving on here, we have our 
Uh, outside shower, we referenced this when we talked about draining the water heater or depressurizing the water heater. Uh, it's excellent for that. Other than that, you are going to find hot and cold here uh, on the, the fixture and you will have a on off control or volume control here on the sprayer. Uh, what that's used for is going to be cut off, cutting off your flow of water uh, to help you conserve that six gallon water heater capacity uh, to allow you to take a full shower. Uh, this wraps around the fixture, your sprayer and hose wrap around the fixture. Everything is self-contained, uh, even does have a little holder there for your shower head. Uh, taking a look down low to make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, what we will find here is going to be your seven way receptacle. Uh, this is either going to plug into seven way receptacle on your bumper, or if you have a fifth wheel connection, you can also plug this into the truck, uh, the bed of your truck. Now this will give you full function to your uh, trucks, uh, marker lights, tail lights, charging system, things like that. So as long as this is plugged into either your bumper receptacle or your fifth wheel receptacle, at that point, think of it as two large vehicle, or excuse me, think about it as one large vehicle. Uh, same rules apply if you were to leave something on, the, on inside the camper indefinitely, it will eventually kill the battery of your tow vehicle or truck. All right, guys, first thing we are going to come to here at the rear is going to be our sewage hose storage. Uh, now, this is just a secondary compartment uh, meant for nothing more but to house your sewage hose. So what you will do is you will feed this in there like so. So just a storage compartment to keep you from having to store your nasty sewage hose with any of your other stuff. So if we go ahead and remove that, we're going to come down here and we are going to talk about everybody's favorite thing, and that is dumping your wastewater. So if we look deep into this compartment, we have two valves, uh, blade valves. Uh, I can see your gray water is here or your gray handle for your gray water holding tank. Uh, gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or shower, relatively cleaner of the two. And then probably hard to see on camera, but if we come up here uh, towards the rear of the compartment, we will see our black blade X handle. Uh, black for black water, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. So your solid body waste, toilet paper, all of that fun stuff. Uh, it's very important that we do operate these in the correct fashion. Uh, it is going to be our goal to uh, only dump these tanks as necessary. So even when we are hooked up to full-time septic, it is very important that we keep these valves in the closed position. Uh, what that means is that we are going to keep those tanks in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, onboard monitor panel will uh, let us know that they are full or we will dump them if we are changing location. So whichever happens first. So uh, these are in the closed position now to open either one of them. It is going to be a six inch pull towards you. Uh, also keep in mind that we never wanna have both of those valves open at the same time. We wanna avoid any cross contamination or back feeding bef between the two holding tank systems. Uh, separating those two tanks or, or excuse me, separating those two handles or in between those two handles uh, is going to be your bayonet fitting. Now this is a standard RV style fitting. Uh, and what that means for us is that no matter which hose you choose to buy, it will have that bayonet fitting here on the end. So here on the outside, we have four prongs. Uh, we have two keyholes on the sewage hose. We will put that in the halfway position, give it an eighth inch turn to the right, or probably a little bit more than that. So we're going to go ahead and turn that until that locks on. That's going to give us a nice watertight connection. Uh, make sure you are fully engaging those keyholes so you're not having any dripping or anything coming from this location. Uh, once we've done that, a very popular option when it does come to dump our waste is going to be dumping our black water first. Uh, once we are satisfied there, we close that valve off. We then open up that gray water. What that's going to do is rinse any shared plumbing between the two systems, as well as our sewage hose on the way out. Now also, while we are here at the rear, we are going to talk about just good general structural maintenance of the unit. Uh, every 90 days, we are going to do a 360 degree top to bottom inspection of the seals on the unit. So uh, anywhere we look here on the unit that the manufacturer has utilized or that has 
two pieces coming together, the manufacturer has utilized some sort of sealant. Generally on the body, you will find a 100% silicone product. If we see any degradation in those seals, any separation, cracking, peeling, any of that stuff, we need to make sure that we touch that up immediately. And as long as it's on the body, you will use a 100% silicone product. On the roof, they are going to use a self-leveling lap sealant, which is a slightly different product. But again, we are looking for the same signs of degradation. If we do see any cracking, peeling, separation, anything like that, we will source that, uh, that self-leveling sealant from an RV dealer. What that will allow us to do or how we go ahead and touch that up is, as the name implies, it's self-leveling. So when we are applying it, we are going to kind of use a heavy hand and puddle that on. As it goes to dry, it's going to uh, spread out covering those problem areas. Very, very important that we do inspect the unit every 90 days uh, to keep any water intrusion at bay. Also here at the rear, we have our awning. Uh, now that is a power awning controlled from a switch there on the inside. We'll make sure we talk about how to function that switch uh, on, when we get there. Uh, also, we have our standard RV style assist rail. Now this does lock in that extended position. Uh, when it is time to go down the road, we can either fold it against the uh, body of the camper if we wish to do so, or against the door, whichever makes you feel more comfortable. Uh, but we do need to lift up into that position. Very easy to do. All right, guys, so first things first, up top here we are going to find our outside speakers. Uh, those are going to, of course, correspond with the head unit that we have, again, on the interior of the unit. Uh, we will make sure that we do, again, get your eyes on that uh, and let you know how to control these outside speakers. Uh, also here we have our refrigerator vent. Now this is going to fall into what we would consider a non-customer serviceable unit. Uh, they generally will stay in good working order. What will help with that is going to be applying some aftermarket bug screens here to your vents. Uh, the reason why you would want to do that is mud daubers are attracted to the smell of propane. Uh, this of course is a propane appliance. They would like nothing more than to go ahead and make this their new home. So. That not only goes with our refrigerator vent here, but that goes with our furnace vent down here, our water heater vent on the other side. We want to make sure that we do screen those off to keep those flying insects from nesting within the appliance. Other than that, uh, with those bug screens in place, we're going to go ahead and remove this vent panel maybe every 90 days or so. Give this a visual inspection, make sure we don't see any frayed wires, uh, you know, disconnected lines or, or whatever. Uh, just give it a visual inspection, make sure things look good. If it's operating properly, then you are going to be uh, in good shape. Now, when we are going to either remove or install our vent here, we need to line up our tabs up top first, and then we will seat the locking tabs on the bottom. Once everything sits nice and flush, we just go ahead, turn these. That's going to keep them locked on. I always go back, give it a secondary pull, make sure it is in fact locked on. A ton of these have been lost going down the road. And the only thing that needed to be do, done to avoid that is to just go ahead and check and make sure it is actually locked on. And then as mentioned previously, we have our uh, suburban furnace vent here. This is an exhaust vent. Best thing we can do for the appliance is let it exhaust. Uh, this does blow very hot air when it is on. Make sure it's breathing properly. Make sure that we do go ahead and install those bug screens. This is going to be, of course, operated by the thermostat on the interior. We'll make sure we show you how to use that when we get to that. And then we have our propane cylinder here. Uh, now this is not your standard barbecue grill propane cylinder. Uh, this is designed to be utilized here in this secondary position. Uh, so it's unfortunately not something you're going to be able to easily exchange out there on the road, uh, but you can have it refilled very, very easily. Uh, again, 20 pound propane cylinder. Uh, it's easy to remove. So what we would do if we were removing it is we are going to push back what that will allow us to do is actually overcome this bracket here, lift that tank out of the way, of course, once we've turned this service valve into the off position and disconnected our propane pigtail. We can go ahead and pull that out, uh, have it filled, serviced, whatever we need to do. Uh, now, I do believe that just about covers it here on the exterior of the 80RB. Let's go hop on the inside and take a look at those features. As we make our way here onto the inside of the unit, uh, first thing I want to talk about is how you operate this Happy Jack remote. So uh, orientation is always going to be from the rear as if you were facing 
uh, forward towards the cab over. So looking here at the remote, we have our driver's side front jack, driver's side rear jack, passenger front, passenger rear, or all jacks at the same time. Uh, now to turn this remote on and get it paired with the board, we push the two center buttons and the two top buttons. And now once we've done that, we can go ahead and adjust the jacks, lift the unit up or down as needed. Uh, now in the event that this were to go ahead and uh, this of course runs on batteries, I should say first, uh, if those batteries were to go dead, you can go ahead and remove this plug here on the side. Uh, what you'll find there in your unit paperwork is going to be a, uh, looks like an old telephone handset. It's actually a communication board or communication cord. And what that will allow you to do is plug your remote directly into your jack board and allow you to again load and unload the unit if this were to, uh, the batteries inside were to run dead for you. Uh, now also right here inside the door, we have your fire extinguisher. Now this is a very important piece of safety equipment. Uh, it's, it's very important that we do test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, you'll find a green tab here on the top of the unit. If we push that in uh, and it springs back, that means the unit has life in it. It's ready to go in the event that we need it. If it stays depressed, it means that it's time to go ahead and replace that fire extinguisher. All right, again, right inside the door here, first up is going to be our restroom. Uh, not too terribly much to go over in there. Now you do have a vent fan on the roof. Uh, you are going to use that to pull any moisture from the air, uh, specifically while showering. So uh, only two buttons on it, one to go ahead and push on the handle and you're going to lift up on that or push up on that. And then the next one is just to go ahead and turn that circulation fan on. Uh, also here we have our shower head. Uh, now, down there at the wall side, it's going to look just like any other water fixture that you've ever used. But here on the shower head, it's important to note that we do have an on-off switch there. Uh, what that allows us to do is go ahead and turn off that, that flow of water on and off. Uh, what, again, overall that will allow us to do is conserve water consumption. Uh, as mentioned on the exterior of the unit, we have a six gallon capacity water heater. Uh, generally, that just does not translate to an exceptionally long shower. Uh, what we find most of our customers do is take military or navy style showers where uh, you're in turn cutting that flow of water on and off multiple times uh, during your shower and of course this on off switch here at the fixture is going to aid in that um, putting that back we can talk about your uh, restroom or your toilet uh, you have a pedal flush here on the bottom it will be a light press on that pedal uh, to go ahead and feed water to the bowl. Not a bad idea to always keep some water in the bowl. That's gonna help keep those bad smells down uh, when you do go to flush. And then when we go to flush, we just go ahead and push all the way down to the floor. Uh, now it's worth talking about that any toilet chemicals that you are going to use or feed into that black water holding tank are going to be inserted through the uh, top of the toilet. So whether that's going to be deodorizer, chemical treatment, something like that, uh, tissue dissolver, t sensor cleaner, whatever uh, of course follow the manufacturer's recommendation of the specific product that you're using uh, and also just a reminder we do need to use a single ply rv grade toilet paper and if our specific camping situation allows us to do so uh, we want to feed as much water into that black water holding tank when we do go to flush that toilet to the left of the entry door we are going to find our awning light switch as well as awning control underneath the overhead cabinetry uh, what we have here is going to be a, a lighted switch. Of course, we don't have power supplied to the unit, um, but if we did and we wanted to turn those awning lights on, that's going to indicate red to us. Uh, reason being is you cannot see those awning lights when you are, uh, of course, have that awning rolled in. So uh, it's a nice feature uh, in the event that they were to get turned on inadvertently, you would know that they were on. Uh, in case of doing like if you're doing some boot knocking or something you don't want those on and lights to unnecessarily drain your battery and then we do have a, a switch here for our awning it is labeled in terms of direction uh, and it's a momentary switch so we can really control how far out we extend that awning or retract it uh, now one thing to remember is if i were to hold this in the extend position or the out position indefinitely it's going to reach that fully extended position and then start to roll in inside out or backwards. So uh, that's something of course you want to avoid. So make sure you are watching that to 
reach its max position and stopping immediately there. Uh, if you happen to go ahead and um, overextend it, just make sure that you do not store it in that overextended position and correct the issue as soon as possible. Our carbon monoxide and smoke alarm is going to be located right above my head here. Uh, now this does run on a nine volt battery. Uh, it will need to be tested every single time we take the unit out. And also my secondary recommendation is be sure to keep a spare nine volt battery with you in the event you need one while camping. Next up, we are going to talk about how to uh, take our kind of dinette table or dinette area and make that into a secondary sleeping area. Uh, so our dinette table here is made up of three separate pieces, one being the floor, pan, floor flange, uh, the next being the support pole, and of course our tabletop here. Uh, now what we are going to do is we need to separate those pieces. So we're going to start uh, with the tabletop. Now there is a little tension spring there that keeps that kind of connected. Uh, so you need to overcome that. Now it's going to be my recommendation to kind of grab from the wood piece here. And what you will do is kind of work this out until that, well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. So what we do is we then go ahead and flip the tabletop off uh, and, and go ahead and release this. Um, and it, it's really kind of, you know, it takes a slight amount of effort and it's, it's really secure, which is a good thing. So, uh, and then we would kind of reimagine that the tabletop had come off of the floor flange um, while this was still connected. So what you have down here is going to be a coupler and we just need to unlock that. So we're going to twist that counterclockwise. What that's going to do is allow us to then go ahead and remove the floor flange here. And we can kind of take a look at how uh, those correspond. So you have the three kind of fans here. And if you line those up with the corresponding hole. So with that fully inserted there, we're then going to uh, rotate this to its stops and then tighten our coupler down. Uh, so kind of going back to what our intention was, we go ahead, we remove the floor flange, we get that out of the way. Uh, and we want to finish making this into, again, a secondary sleeping area. Uh, we can store our table away if we need to do so. We will remove our side cushions. And then we just lift here from the back. And that cushion is going to flip all the way over. If your tabletop is out of the way. And we'll lay relatively flat, giving you, again, a secondary sleeping area here in the living room of the camper. Above our couch here, we are going to find our Jensen stereo unit. Uh, this is very kind of user friendly, kind of basic on the control side of things. Uh, one thing worth noting is going to be this zone button. Uh, that's how we are going to control the different zones of speakers. Now you have speakers here on the inside, uh, which I believe the only set is going to be the ones here on either side of the cabinetry. Uh, but we also have that set of speakers we saw on the exterior of the unit. Uh, you will again control the volume of each zone separately so be sure that if you do not want music playing you know to the exterior of the unit that you are controlling that here through the zones button uh, and then up top here above my head we have a light now all the lights here are going to be the same style they're going to be push button so you push that silver button that's going to turn that light on or off uh, and then here on the far wall we have our suburban thermostat uh, now this is how we are going to, of course, control the furnace within this unit. Now what we have when we go ahead here and look at this unit is one single uh, kind of comfort level setting. You can see it's not marked by the degree or anything, but we do have a uh, thermometer here that will tell us what the temperature is within the unit. And to turn that on, we just slide this to our comfort, comfort level. What that will do is kick on that blower motor almost immediately. Uh, 16 seconds after that, it's going to start its lighting cycle. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, somewhere generally around the minute, minute and a half mark, it may set off your smoke alarm. Uh, per the manufacturer, which is Suburban in this case, that is completely acceptable of the appliance. Uh, as it runs, the efficiency rating goes uh, way up. As you're driving down the road with this particular unit, you're gonna have dust and debris depositing onto the furnace and it is just working to burn that off within that first 15 minutes of operation. Then when we wanna go ahead and turn it off, we will slide this until we feel that click. Uh, do keep in mind that this will continue to run for about two minutes while it enters that cool down cycle. 
Uh, so it's not going to stop immediately once we go ahead and, and turn the uh, thermostat to that off position. Uh, and then while talking about kind of that same thing, we have our air conditioner controls here on top of the unit. Uh, you will have one that will have different fan speeds. Uh, you'll have those same fan speeds, but in an air conditioner variant. And then we also have a temperature control here that will help us control that setting kind of within the setting or thermostat, I should say. Uh, you do have removable, reusable filters. Uh, as you use the unit, dust and debris is going to deposit on this particular unit. You can pull it out from the front here. You have one on each side, rinse it off in the sink, give it time to dry, go ahead and replace it when you're done. All right, guys, now taking a look here at our kitchen. Uh, first things first, up top, we have a standard kind of run of the mill microwave. Uh, not that there's nothing special about it, but it is gonna function just very much like you're used to. Uh, you'll find a turntable on the inside, of course, in terms of functionality. Again, you'll have some uh, presets up top, time and temperature below that, start, stop, kind of your basic uh, setup there. We have our Furon hood vent below that. Uh, that's gonna give us access to a fan and light like you are traditionally used to seeing. And then down below, we have our Dometic uh, two burner cooktop. So when we light the burner, we are just going to turn the uh, burner we wish to light to light. And then we just go ahead and activate your igniter here until we see our flame at the burner. I give it a couple seconds for that thermal coupler to heat up and then we can go ahead and move this uh, to fine tune the intensity of our flame. First thing we are going to talk about here is the fact that we are pre-wired for Go Power Solar. So what that means for you is the manufacturer has made it very easy to go ahead and add that at your leisure. Uh, all of those connections are going to be ran to this location. Uh, so all that we need to do is mount our panel on the roof and mount our charge controller here again at this location. And then down below that, we have our convenience center courtesy panel. It goes by quite a, quite a few different names here in the industry. Uh, what this is going to not only do is give us, this is not only, excuse me, going to give us a uh, real-time readout of where all of our tanks sit and level of full and we have fresh water, black water, and gray water. Uh, if we push the button and look here up at the scale, the fuller or, or the more lights we see, uh, the fuller that particular tank or source we are evaluating is going to be. And then we also have a battery uh, indicator as well. Now that battery will indicate full anytime we are plugged into shore power. To get a true readout of where that battery sits, we of course need to unplug from shore power and then again evaluate from this location. So what we have down below here is going to be our water heater switch. Uh, now this is a propane only 12 volt direct spark ignition driven appliance. Uh, there's no pilot light to uh, light or anything like that. All we need to do is go ahead and turn the appliance on and it will start its lighting cycle. Uh, now these units will cycle three times or try and light three separate times. If they do not light by the end of that third cycle, it's going to go ahead and illuminate this DSI fault light. Uh, once that light is illuminated and stays on, the appliance is going to stop lighting or stop trying to light. Uh, the reason why it may go through its lighting cycle and ultimately not light, uh, generally the reasons why we see that happening is uh, oftentimes you may not have propane in the bottle, uh, you may have not turned your service valve on, or just possibly because of the location of the tanks to the appliance, just may not have made its way through the line to the appliance. In the event that that does happen, all we need to do is of course check, make sure you have propane in the tank, make sure that uh, the service valve is on, and we will turn this switch to the off position, turn it back on, it's going to start that lighting cycle over. And then we have our water pump switch. Uh, as we talked about on the exterior, that's gonna pressurize that fresh water holding system, uh, draw that water up from the tank to the fixture to make it usable. We have our entry light here. Uh, what that's going to do is just going to uh, give us a one light uh, that will turn on, uh, you know, just kind of a common switch to go ahead and light the overhead lights on. And then we have our porch light, which is going to be the light that we saw over the entry door, again, to kind of help our way as we enter the unit at dark time. What we have here is going to be our breaker box converter and fuse panel holder. Of course, here on the left side, we see our automotive replaceable blade style fuses. Um, not a bad idea to go ahead and pick up a variety pack of those fuses. Keep them with the unit in the event that you need to change one while using the unit. 
Uh, on the right side, we have our 110 volt resettable breaker, same variant you're going to find in your fuse panel box at home. Everything in terms of function is going to be labeled here on the door. Uh, now, during periods of uh, high power consumption, you will hear a uh, air circulating fan or a fan running back behind here. That's totally normal. Again, that's gonna be used uh, to help cool the unit in periods of, again, high power consumption. Also, as the sticker indicates here, this is capable of charging lithium. So what that would do is make that upgrade to a lithium battery system uh, very easy to accomplish. And then on the right side here, we have our carbon monoxide, excuse me, LP leak detector. Uh, so this is going to be a propane only leak detector. Uh, this is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So there's no battery to, cha to change or maintain, but the same with all of our safety equipment. We do test this every single time we take the unit out. It does have a single button on it. That's what we use to test. Uh, it will indicate to us that it is in good working order with a series of audible tones and light flashes. So here on the underside of this cabinet, we are going to find our low point drains and freshwater holding tank drain. Uh, also on the underside here, we are going to find our vacuum inlet for our winterization processes. Uh, when fully winterizing the unit, what we do is we drain all of the water from the unit. Uh, generally, you're gonna be starting in this location with, with your freshwater holding tank. If it's been in use, we'll then go ahead and drain these low point drains. Those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. That's how we are going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. Uh, once we've went ahead and done that, we need to uh, bypass the water heater. Uh, that's gonna be done here in this compartment up top. We will remove these two screws. We will put that water heater into bypass mode. We'll then come back down here into this compartment. We're going to take our vacuum hose here, remove the cap that is on the end of it, we will go ahead and stick this directly into our bottle of RV grade antifreeze. And then if we go ahead and follow this line back to the nearest valve, we're gonna open up that valve. Now, once we've done so, we're gonna use our water pump to introduce that antifreeze into the system. So we need to go ahead and turn that water pump on. Once we've done that, we're gonna walk from water fixture to water fixture, including the toilet, and open both the hot and the cold side of the plumbing until we see that antifreeze at the fixture. Once we've done so, we give it a couple seconds to fill the P-traps and the plumbing on the way out. And once we've done all of that, we are going to be ready for storage over the winter. So taking a look here at our refrigerator, what we have here is going to be a Dometic three source refrigerator. So what that means is it will run on 12 volt uh, battery power only. It will run on propane gas and it will also run on 110 volt electricity. Uh, we see all three of those sources outlined here. Uh, so of course, starting up to the left, we have our uh, on off switch. We're gonna go ahead and hold that. You'll see the unit kind of power up, go through a boot up and you are ready to choose your source, which the wall plug here is going to be AC voltage. The flame here is of course going to be propane gas and the battery is going to be 12 volt. Uh, we're then gonna go ahead and choose how cool we wanna run the unit. Uh, so the the uh, lower you are on the scale, the warmer the temperature is going to be, the higher you are, the cooler it will be. And then what we have here is going to be a like kind of like code acknowledgement or a reset button. So say we went to go ahead and light this on propane, it exhausted its lighting cycle, that's gonna start kind of yelling at you and flashing at you. Uh, what this is saying is, okay, I, I accept that, go ahead and try and start to relight. Uh, so it'll send it through its uh, a secondary lighting cycle. And then there's a release button here on the top to go ahead and open the door. Uh, as we go ahead and take a look in there, of course, not too terribly much that's gonna differentiate this from any kind of dorm style refrigerator, uh, but you do have a fold down ice box. Now on this particular unit, that freezer compartment is removable. So if you wanted to kind of store more stuff in here, you can go ahead and remove that freezer compartment. Uh, one thing you can also do is if you are storing the unit, you have a little kind of clip here that you can fold in and out. What that's going to do is if this is in that outward position and we went ahead and shut the door, uh, it's gonna keep that cracked open so it's not gonna do uh, get any mildew or kind of bad smells while in storage. So what we have here above my head is going to be a high powered circulation fan. Of course our open and close uh, is going to be this knob here. To open that, we uh, just go ahead and turn this knob clockwise. 
Uh, once we are in that fully extended position, we can go ahead and choose our speed here. We have uh, three different speed modes. Now this is going to be an exhaust fan. Uh, the ideal way to go ahead and use this is going to be uh, opening up the side windows up here and allowing this to provide a nice strong cross breeze for us. Uh, one thing also worth mentioning is before uh, going down the road, you do want to make sure that this is closed nice and snug. Uh, keep that from flying open going again down the road. All right, guys, we made it. Uh, that just about covers the walkthrough here of the 80RB. Uh, we hope you learned something. If you have any further questions, feel free to give us a call or comment below. We really hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I hope you have an amazing day. Thank you very much.